Good evening and welcome to Radnor Memorial Library. My name is Pam Sador. I'm so glad that you could join us this evening from all over the country. Tonight, Beth is here to help us think about memoir and also to help to write ourselves, write about ourselves. And before we even keep going, I want to say hi to Kathy. Kathy, owner of our indie bookstore here in downtown Wayne, Pennsylvania. And Kathy, um, she probably can agree with me. If you're a bookstore, if you're a library, and if somebody walks in and says, oh, do you have the latest Beth Caphart? That's a loaded question. This year, it was like one of three books. <laughs> so Beth, congratulations. And uh, I want to welcome all of you to this wonderful evening. As you know, Beth Kephart is the author of more than 30 books and has been named a National Book Award finalist. Since that distinction, Beth has won many awards and she is known as Mainline's finest writer. I can attest to that, Kathy, and writing for many readers, both fiction, nonfiction, fiction that to me is enchanting, poetic, deep, and meaningful. And yes, I do read young adult books. <laughs> So Beth is also a creative writing teacher at the University of Pennsylvania and a co-founder of Juncture Writing Workshops, along with her artistic husband, Bill Sulit. So please welcome author Beth Kephart. Thank you all for joining us this evening. And I'm asking you now to please keep yourself muted. Beth, as you can see there on the screen, has a lovely presentation. We are recording this event for people that were unable to join us this evening and uh, for all posterity, it's nice to have Beth at our fingertips and we will. So thank you all for coming. I'm going to mute myself. Welcome Beth, wonderful you, to Pam. see you. Thank you so much Pam for inviting me to do this and Kathy for being who you are. And thank all of you for coming. Thank you for the um, sort of the welcome to this idea. I have been teaching memoir for a long time, thinking about memoir for a long time. My first five books were memoir. My sixth was a memoir of a river. And then I began to write young adult and for children, but was teaching memoir um, at the University of Pennsylvania. It was um, an opportunity all those years of teaching and I still teach there and teach through Juncture to concretize, crystallize, my sense about this form, this form that had seduced me that I fell into um, and, and began ultimately to ask myself, but what does it mean to write memoir? What does it mean to engage in the personal? What is a universal truth? What is a telling detail? And by teaching at Penn and reading sort of nonstop having a now very large library of memoir and essay, I began to understand what this form really is. I had not published a memoir in many years. I just was teaching it, thinking about it. And then ultimately, I, um, I did publish this year in March, Wife, Daughter, Self. Wife, Daughter, Self applies a lot of the lessons that I've been teaching to my students through the years. And so tonight's presentation is, is about self-portraiture. It's one aspect of, of memoir writing, not in any way the only one. Um, and into this presentation, I have sliced small excerpts of Wife, Daughter, Self to take that moment and to say, so how did I apply this idea to my own work? So we're going to get going. I want to begin with um, this really remark, Kathy and I were talking earlier about what I've been reading lately. This book, Places I've Taken My Body, a collection of essays by the great poet Molly McCulley Brown, has been transformative. I was speaking about this Sunday during one of my juncture workshops. I'm going to read this small piece from one of the essays in the book because I think this is purely perfect self-portraiture in just a handful of sentences. Look at everything she does here. You should know, but it'll become clear that she was born early with cerebral palsy, and it has been a challenge throughout her life with multiple surgeries and, and also the loss of her twin sister during that birth. I learned early to love that I was fierce. 
to understand that my willingness to go to battle was a star under which I would thrive. You need a lot of grit, a little rage to wrestle pain. The story goes that I came into the world blue and tiny and sparring for my place in it. Two pounds with my fists up. Watch out, the nurses said, watch out, you've got a fighter. Self-portraiture contains the entire character of who she is, as well as the history of how she got to be who she is. And it's alive and it's engaging. Tonight, we have a plan. The plan is this. We're going to distinguish between classifying ourselves, looking at ourselves, and seeing ourselves. Those are, in my estimation, three different things. We're going to consider how writing about ourselves within the context of a we slants or emboldens self-portraiture. We're going to look at how we confess and exhibit ourselves. We're going to think about how we might forgive ourselves. We're going to think about how we might write ourselves even when some evidence is missing. And uh, we, we are also through this, I'm going to have a few prompts for you to write down, you know, do them later, um, and a few question cascades. I've, I developed the question cascade idea with a workbook Bill and I produced several years ago, tell, well, not that many years ago, tell the truth, make it matter. And in this book, in part of the book, there are question cascades that enable someone to move from the more simple inquiry to the more complex. And I like, I like to see how that affects the way we think about ourselves. Throughout this presentation too are a few self-portraits that are not bills obviously, but he uh, curated them for me um, and for this presentation. This is the great Vivian Meyer. Uh, there's a wonderful documentary on her, just know that, look for her. She was an extraordinary photographer who was not known to be photographing by most people during the world. So the simplest way, the most direct and obvious way to write ourselves onto the page is to classify ourselves with mere assertions. And in the case of Kakpur's Sick, a memoir, this is an excerpt from it, in which you can see that she is labeling herself. That's, that's the beginning, that's the first layer. She writes, in high school, my senior year was something I plucked out of Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Through angers, losses, ambition, ignorance, ennui, what you are picks its way. I was always someone who had a great sense of herself, most likely to have her own advice column I got in my senior yearbook, Wild Horse, I got from my mother as a teen. A little bit know-it-all, mischievous, outgoing, friendly, hot-tempered, smart, more grounded than I seemed. If there was one thing I never had to wonder about, it was who I was. So look at that. It is a list. It's naming, mischievous, outgoing, friendly, hot-tempered. It's a list. It's an assertion. That is a kind of self-portraiture, that's the first layer. You can also classify yourself by the things others have um, told, told you about yourself. So Corey Stamper in Word by Word, The Secret Life of Dictionaries, she's not telling you what she thinks she is in this small excerpt. She's, she's reporting on what others have told her about herself. It's one layer up. I grew up the eldest book-loving child of a blue-collar family that was not particularly literary. According to the hagiography, I started reading at three, rattling off the names of road signs on car trips and pulling salad dressing bottles out of the fridge to roll their tangy names around in my tongue. Blue cheesy, Italian, thousand, Iceland. My parents cooed over my precociousness but thought little of it. So look at that. She's not naming herself precocious. She is saying that others thought she was. She was reporting on herself. And it's a softened approach. It's a little more approachable as a reader, um, you know, re finding that on the page. Oops, went the wrong direction there. So a question cascade for you. I'm going to read it slowly so that you can take the notes. The words you would use to describe your talents are what? The words you would use to describe your intelligence are what? 
How about the words you would use to describe your extrovert introvertness? Or the words you would use to describe your self-confidence? How about your politics? How about your self-assertiveness? How about your energy? Moving always in these question cascades from what's easy to hang on to. I know what I am, I cook, I make paper. You know, I used to be a figure skater. Intelligence, hmm, sometimes I feel smarter than other days. Um, extrovert, introvert, kind of depends on the situation, doesn't it? So you, you're going from something that's hard and, you know, sort of easier to harder and you're learning about yourself along the way. You're getting a little less self-assured. You're entering interesting terrain. That's gonna end up in a story somewhere. Now, we looked at classifying ourselves, now looking at ourselves. First, you can look at your genetic and country origins as Alexandra Fuller does in her first of many memoirs, Don't Let's Go to the Dogs Tonight in African Childhood, she wrote, my God, I am the wrong color. The way I am burned by the sun, scorched by flinging sand, crippled by heat. The way my skin erupts in miniature volcanoes of protest in the presence of flies, mosquitoes, ticks. The way I stand out against the khaki bush like a large marshmallow to a peak with a gun, white African, white but what are you, I am asked over and over again, where are you from originally, a childhood spent in Rhodesia? There is a skipping thing that's happening here. Another looking at ourselves is the way we disguise ourselves. How do the disguises we choose reveal us? Alexander Chi in an essay called Girl finds the truest him in a mirror after he has applied makeup. He writes, my face in the makeup I have just applied is a success. My high cheekbones, large slanting eyes, wide mouth, small chin and rounded jaw have been restrung in base, powder, eyeliner, lipstick, eyebrow pencil. With these tools, I have built another face on top of my own, unrecognizable, and yet I am already adjusting to it. Somehow I've always known how to put this face together. So Alexandra Fuller looks at herself. I am a white woman in a country where I'm not quite sure I belong. She's classifying herself that way. She is classifying himself according to this disguise that reveals him. In this part of wife, daughter, self, and, and this actually comes at the very end, I am also in a kind of disguise. My mother is in her final months really of her life, but I don't know that. She's in a hospital bed and I have come from a ballroom dance competition or performance. Um, and, you know, I'm a tomboy. My mother has known me as the kickball girl with the mud, you know, in her, in her hair and in her feet, you know, growing up that way. And I rush to the hospital in this red plunging dress with this black beaded belt, my hair up, they've done my hair, I've done makeup. And all her life, my mother was waiting for me to be beautiful, to take the time with myself to be beautiful. And, and, and I'm rushing down the hallway to see her. I have an orange orchid in my hand and I'm still in the shoes and everything. Um, and she sees me as she needs to see me. And I see in her eyes what I've always needed to see in her eyes. So this is how that goes. I stood where I was not moving, not breaking the illusion of my temporary self, just being what my mother needed finally and especially then to see a firstborn daughter in a red dress with smooth hair in a gray room of hospital machines, a pumpkin colored orchid in her hand, lending credence to the idea that it was only my mother's illness that was temporary. So I have, I have disguised myself to see myself in a way I always needed to. There are other ways that you, as you write, might decide to look at yourself. One additional idea comes from Michelle T in an essay called Summer of Lost Jobs. And she writes, 
I knew how I wanted to appear and it was not how I appeared naturally. I had no time for my own transformation, wanted only to turn to the mirror and behold white, white skin, bloodless, the skin of girls in fairy tales, horror stories, and very old poems. So here she's looking at herself by measuring the difference between hope and actuality. Is that a prompt? Is that a way for you to look at yourself, for you to gauge yourself more wholly, to write yourself more completely, to engage in different kinds of scenes than the ones you have perhaps been going in? An exercise now related to looking at ourselves. Write about a moment when you try to transform your physical self, being as particular as you can be about the face or body that you had and the face or body that you sought to become and why. I'll just give you a second to write that down. This is Brian Oldham. So we've classified ourselves, we've looked at ourselves. How about seeing ourselves? And as you can see, it's a gradation always with me when I think about how we deconstruct books and how we, how we write towards ourselves. It's a layering and it's a layering. Seeing ourselves, we might see ourselves as a difference, which is certainly what Mark Richard in House of Prayer number two did. Uh, this is an extraordinary book that begins in the third person, but carries mostly through as second person. And he is presenting, this book I so highly recommend, it's, it's an older book. Um, I'm not sure if he's done anything this big, a large scale uh, since this came out, but it's a very special book. Say you have a special child, it essentially begins the book, which in the South means somewhere between Downs and dyslexic. Birth him with his father away on army maneuvers along East Texas bayous. Take the infant to Manhattan, Kansas in winter, where the only visitor is a Chinese peeping Tom, little yellow face in the windows, during the cold nights, further frighten the mother, age 20, with the child's convulsions. There's something different about this child, the doctors say. And indeed, the entire book is about that difference, that physical difference. Um, he has some terrible surgery in a terrible place when he's young. His hips don't work. Um, he sees the world differently, reads it differently, learns differently. Um, and the entire book is presented through the lens of difference. But you could also choose not as different, but as an outsider, which is certainly what we find in Jeanette Winterson's Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal. And she's an outsider because perhaps adoption, but also because perhaps who the adopting mother has been to her. Adoption is outside. You act out what it feels like to be the one who doesn't belong and you act it out by trying to do to others what has been done to you. It is impossible to believe that anyone loves you for yourself. So perhaps when you look at your, when you're seeing yourself with this difference as an outsider, certainly I have my entire life seen myself as an outsider. And this particular passage actually comes in the wife section of the book, so earlier on, but it's been an interesting journey for me as a writer. Um, I didn't, I studied the history and sociology of science at Penn. I didn't have any education in writing except for a few very important um, workshops, one with Rosellen Brown and Reginald Gibbons in Spoleto, Italy, one with Jane Ann Phillips in Prague, and then again with Jane Ann Phillips at Bredlow. But I didn't know writers. My friends weren't writers. I didn't know the language or the community of writers. And oddly sort of fell, you know, my first book, I only say this because it was extremely strange to me then it is to me now, but it was a National Book Award finalist and won a number of other awards. And, and there I am not even knowing what it is. I'm in London um, when we get the, we would get, all these messages slipped under a hotel room, you know, you're a National Book Award finalist. And I'm saying to Bill, what, what is that? I was that much of an outsider. And though I've published many books and though I have exquisite friendships with very important people who are very important to me who are writers, 
I still see myself as an outsider. About an hour before this began today, someone I met first when she was working on her book and now she's become extremely famous, Nicole Chung. She's now writing for The Atlantic. Um, she posted on Facebook and, and linked me that in something she'd written for The Atlantic, she wrote about, she referenced handling the truth and my writing books, my memoir writing books. And I was so stunned by that because I never think that I'm part of the circle of writers. I am in this part of the book during a very depressed time in my life when I'm pretty sure I'll never publish another book. And this is who I am. You take a job, you take another job, you prize and you bespeak, you bow and shrink, you teach and you teach, you write for others, you write of others, you write, you cannot help it slant. And you remember yourself in the pink seersucker dress. That's the dress I wore the National Book Awards night. And the night before was the eggplant colored gown. You feel harassed by the previous she. And maybe you will never sleep again. Maybe you are too exhausted now to dream because oddly having been brought into that world's awards world and Pam, you might want to let Gwen into the room. Um, you, um, it, it suddenly makes you something or someone that you're not sure you are. And then when you are no longer winning those awards, you're no longer on the top of all the list, you're suddenly wondering are you the person you once were? Are you the person, you know, so seeing yourself as an outsider, I relate to that. But hey, why always be hard on yourself? You can also see yourself with self-deprecating humor, the great Julian Barnes and nothing to be frightened of. I don't believe in God, but I miss him. That's what I say when the question is put. I ask my brother who has taught philosophy at Oxford, Geneva and the Sorbonne, what he thought of such a statement without revealing that it was my own, he replied with a single word, soppy. Self-deprecating humor, why not? How about if we look at ourselves through the lens of others? Nell Painter, very famous historian, decides that she wants to become a painter. In her 60s, I think she was. Her memoir is Old in Art School. And suddenly she's just, She's like me right now, you know, I'm making these books, these blank books, I'm learning textures and materials, I'm so excited about it all. I'm older, it's new. I'm not thinking I'm older and it's new, I'm just thinking I'm having fun. That's what she was thinking until she started to see herself through the eyes of others. The crucial fact of my age emerged, not as an incidental, but as my defining characteristic of how others saw me as a demand to see myself through their eyes. It was as though being old summed me up. Not all the things I had done to become a historian, a goddamn distinguished historian, not the singular family I come from, not even my fascinating beleaguered city of Newark in my eternally dist state of New Jersey. Being seen as an old woman added a new way of seeing myself as reflected in the eyes of others. How do others see you? How do you imagine they see you? Is this part of, could it be part of the story you're writing? And then we also kind of can see ourselves, I know I often do, it's my temperament, for better, for worse, with regret. And wife, daughter, self, the, third, the middle section is daughter. My father passed away August, 2020. He, uh, my mother had passed away many years before that, and he wanted my husband and me to accompany him on an Alaskan cruise ship. I mean, it was a small National Geographic one. And my husband was like, we're not, we're not ship people. Um, but we went with him. My father was very, my father loved being around people, but he was very shy. My husband, Bill, my wonderful husband, um, he, he's happy in his garage painting or down in the basement doing clay. And I am actually pretty much of an introvert, but I feel the responsibility to be an extrovert. And so on this trip, there were really famous people on this trip, actually, it was quite interesting. But um, I felt the need to be my father's advocate, tour guide, who you're going to have dinner with, let me, let me have Jane over here at the table. And I did all this work thinking I was doing the right thing. But my father, at the very end of the trip, sneaks off 
with there were two young there were women are young my age sisters who um, who really took a liking to my dad. He reminded them of their dad who had passed away, and he sneaks off with one of them into a plane. Doesn't tell me, and so I only find out when he's about to go off in this like little plane. That very afternoon, as the sea lion anchored off Midcock Island, my father flew. He went up and up and up, the pilot in the front and one of the sisters there beside him, the sister who, with him, without my help, without my unnecessary administrations, had hatched the getaway plan. Alone with her, he watched the melting glaciers glisten. He flew toward horizons. He disappeared into the blue. I watched him go from the shore. I watched him vanish. I stood beside my husband, my hands inside my pockets, where my hands belonged. And so a scene, the entire essay builds, this is the last paragraph, builds towards that um, sense of, I thought I had been doing the right thing, I had not. How do we see ourselves when we see ourselves with regret? How do we write it? So another exercise for you. I'm hoping that you're all taking notes on the exercises and that you just enjoy writing towards them in whatever order. So without once referring to your physical appearance, choose a moment in time and write with care about who you saw yourself to be. Now write that same moment and sense of self with irony or humor. All right, so first, you're writing who you saw yourself to be, but you're not allowed to say, I was the girl with brown curly hair. Then it's taking the Julian Barnes approach. Write about it with a sense of irony or humor. And now write that same exact moment and sense of self from a place of regret. How does your language, language shift? And how does the story? One of the most important things that you can get out of tonight, I think, is that your job as a memoirist is to always look at things in three dimensions, four dimensions, as many dimensions as you can hold in your head or on the page. It's never enough. You will never have greatness, and, and by greatness, I mean complexity in the work that you're doing if you just go at things in a linear, as we saw early on with you know sick, just you can't simply assert who you are. You have to keep upping the ante for yourself. And here I'm asking you to up the ante by taking the same scene and doing it through three very different lenses and seeing what falls out of that. And my husband's favorite uh, painter, Sheila, so portraits by him. So we've gone through these various steps and now this we that I referenced in our plan this inserting ourselves into the biography of another is the first approach here. Jen Shackland got a lot of wonderful and wonderfully deserved praise for her, my autobiography of Carson McCullers. The other thing I hope you take away from tonight is a reading list and I'll go to Kathy's store, buy all these books. Um, the, uh, or to the library um, too. The, the, the goal of Jen Shackland she found these letters, this indication that Carson McCullers may have, um, although she was married to a man and then remarried the man, might have really loved women. And Jen Chaplin was at that time when she was first doing this research, not quite out with her own um, sense of who she was. Um, and so she began to knit together her own story and Carson McCullers' story, so much so that she went and lived in Carson McCullers' house, which is kind of a museum, but you can live in the house. She went to the retreats that McCullers uh, that, that did. And, and, and so one story amplifies the other. And Jen Chaplin says in the beginning, to tell her own story, a writer must make herself a character. To tell another person's story, a writer must make that person some version of herself must find a way to inhabit her. This book, Jen's book, takes place in the fluid distance between the writer and her subject in the fashioning of a self in all its permutations on the page. Now, I had not read, in fact, it hadn't come out yet, 
in, in fact, I want to say about Jen Shacklin's book, and I, I wrote about this. There's a lot in my book, We Are the Words, that is be well beyond what I was teaching over Zoom. Um, and some of that is the essay work that I've had published in places like Lit Hub um, about these bigger issues about form, Heather Crystal's The Crying Game. And I do talk about Jen Shackland and Mark Doty and others who began to take a very important person and sort of marry themselves. Uh, Mark Doty did it with Walt Whitman, for example. I did not know any of this was going on when I fell in love with Henriette Wyeth. Henriette Wyeth was the oldest daughter of N.C. Wyeth and N.C. Wyeth at the turn of last century was really one of the most important illustrators um, of this country. He, he was just, uh, he, he was the guy. <laughs> and the Wyeth family, Andrew Wyeth, of course, was Henriette Wyeth, one of her younger brothers. They had a beautiful home in the Chadsworth area, which is about an hour from where I live. From the time I was 13 years old, I was going to that museum and began over time to think a lot about Henriette Wyeth. I thought of her, I began to think of her as the apostrophe wife. She was Paul Horgan's best friend who was one of my favorite writers. She was Andrew Wyeth's sister. She was her husband. He was, he, he kind of determined so much about her life. She was his wife. She was her father's daughter. Well, who the hell was she? She was just full of all these apostrophes. And so I began to say, oh my gosh, there's so much in me that parallels Henriette Wyatt. Straight down to what kind of wedding dress and hat she wore, this wear, uh, there were so many similarities. And there's a very long essay in Self, the wife, daughter, self, self portion about Henriette Wyatt and this kind of me trying to figure out I kind of feel like an apostrophe wife myself. Um, what can I learn from Henriette about her and about me? And how is that going to get amplified? And this was a three or four year process of me studying her, reading her, trying to understand her and me. This is just from the very, very beginning of that essay. In 1921, 13 year old Henriette Wyatt moves from Chadsford, Pennsylvania to Needham, Massachusetts, her father's birthplace. He hopes the move will be the start of a new career for he has made his fame as an illustrator and he is desperate to be known as an artist. In 1968, eight-year-old Beth Kephart moves from Wilmington, Delaware, not far from Chatsworth, to Needham, Massachusetts, where her father will attend a graduate school program, the start he hopes of a new career, one that moves him further from his, from his days in the noise and raining muck of an oil refinery and in the outpost of Alberta oil sands toward calm, clean, suburban management. My dad early on was at Marcus Hook, son of a company, putting, literally putting out fires. Um, and all throughout this process of trying to understand Henriette, I made all these discoveries about me. And, um, and it is, I think, something interesting you might want to do yourself is to find someone that obsesses you for whatever reason. She was also F. Scott Fitzgerald's friend. You know, he would come, Zelda and F. Scott would come to their house. They would go, they would, oh, oh my goodness, I wrote novels, young adult novels, and none of them got published. And then I wrote and was able to publish a picture book where Henriette Wyeth, it's one day in her life, she's 10 years old and she's learning to paint with her father and then pulls away a beautifully illustrated book, book by the, a the great Amy Chambers. So um, you can also insert yourself into the family dynamic. Bell Hooks does this. She just goes and she makes a we. We live in the country. We children do not understand that that means we are among the poor. We do not understand that the outhouses behind many of the houses are still there because running water came here long after they had hit in the city. We didn't understand that our playmates who are eating laundry starch do so not because the white powder tastes so good, but because they are sometimes without necessary food. The we. I was foiling myself against Henriette, Jen, Mark Doty. This is inserting to the we. This is 
inserting yourself in the memoir itself into a conversation with another. That happens in Heart Berries. This is the author talking to, through the page, not, not directly, uh, to a lover. I'm not good, but you knew that. So you're getting a conversation that also throws the shade back onto the author. You get to see her twice, sort of double mirrored. Why think less of me in here? You're so economic with your language and your time. I understand your frustration with me. You wanna spare yourself any tax or energy. And I am acutely aware of my impulsivity. It might be all the same to you. Do you still love me? I still want you. Don't think less of me for being crazy. Don't think that I am the only one culpable in my craziness, all right? So inserting into, into a conversation that way. And another pit from wife, daughter, self. Like Abigail Thomas and others, I choose to use multiple pronouns in this book. Um, and in this case, it's a she. But the he is my husband, the she is me, and I'm trying to understand how we came together because we were so very different. And it's inserting, you know, one against the other, one against the other. He, my husband, carried madcaps and misdemeanors forward, nearly fantastical triumphs of self-determination made heroic by the folktales they engendered. He would tame the wild mouse with stolen bread because he had been told no mouse. He would run the sewage tunnels because he'd been strictly warned against. She felt the preponderant responsibility of her name, Beth, which means house of God. Or maybe it was her middle child status. Or maybe it was the swell of ordinariness that she was quick to diagnose within herself. Why was she so quick? What had happened? And just very quickly, I won't read this one through, but Marjorie Sander has left her husband and a garden and a life, and she's moved into another place. And I'll just read the very end. This is about taking yourself again. I'm, I'm trying to give you all these concentric circles with which to work. And it's not about doing a foil against another. It's not about a family we. Um, it is about inserting yourself into a new beginning. So she's in a garden. Um, I take a few breaths and quote my team to myself. It's almost too much for me, the plentitude of the right beginning. Using that as a frame. So an exercise. Write a scene that captures yourself within the context of your family, your friends, your tribe, any world that is larger than yourself. How does asserting yourself as part of a community as opposed to a single individual change your perception of who you are or can be or have been denied being? Just give you a minute, half a minute to write that down. Too much of beginning memoir early pages. And too much of published memoir, to be honest with you, in my opinion, is not, is so one dimensional. And it, it is not contextual, it is not framed, it is not one thing against the other. It is too much about classifying oneself. This is another exercise designed to kind of kick one out of that thought process. We're getting closer to the end, and we'll, we will have questions, of course. Now into that category of confessing ourselves. Some writers confess themselves by naming the diagnosis. And Esme Weijian Wang in The Collected Schizophrenia, which is such a calm and clear-headed book about such a, you know, she's Wang has been diagnosed with schizophrenia. It's really affected the way she's lived her life. I highly recommend you watch uh, YouTube interviews with her. She's just brilliant. And she's written not to, she's written to understand um, and not out of any place of self-pity at all. A diagnosis, she says, is comforting because it provides a framework, a community, a lineage, and if luck is afoot, 
a treatment or cure. A diagnosis says that I'm crazy, but in a particular way, one that has been experienced and recorded not just in modern times, but also by the ancient Egyptians who described a condition similar to schizophrenia in the Book of Hearts and attributed psychosis to the dangerous influence of poison in the heart and uterus. Just calmly saying, this is a diagnosis. This is the history of the diagnosis. It's a calm confession. Leslie Jameson, in an essay called The Quickening, also, here she's talking. Now, Leslie, of course, in her book, The Recovering, talks about alcoholism, and there are other confessions that she's, she's made. Um, but this is about um, being anorectic. When I was living on crackers and apple slicers, I didn't get my period for years. It made me proud. The absence lived inside me like a secret trophy. Blood leaking out of me seemed like another kind of excess. Not bleeding was an appealing form of containment. You can also confess yourself by owing up to your oddities or to your shame. And Emily Pine does this beautifully in an essay called Speaking slash Not Speaking. I tried to make up for being the odd one out by telling stories. She's a kid. I did not realize that stories had to be true. I thought they only had to be interesting. I told stories to the kids in my class. I told them that one weekend I had had a kidney transplant. I told them that the snails on the schoolyard wall were poisonous and planted there by skies who wanted to kill children. My audience listened and then they laughed and then they called me a liar. One Saturday afternoon, I was in the kitchen at home when the phone rang. When I answered, all I heard was giggling. It was the girls in my class who had called to tell me they were having a party and that I was not invited. So a confession of self. This requires you as writers to be extraordinarily vulnerable. In the self part of Wife, Daughter, Self, I talk about how I was this really ordinary kid. And here, this section is the second person, um, this chapter, this essay. Um, and I decided that the only way that I could be an interesting person if, was if I started to lie. And so from that chapter, maybe the lying starts there. Maybe because you failed, you have to be another person. You have to be more interesting than goodness ever was. Not the big stuff, God, no, not even close. You'd need a more original imagination for that. You'd need a touch of charisma, a sensation streak of gleaming deviance. Your lies are mere self-glorifiers. Your lies are medium tall tales. Your lies are what might have happened, but your lies are notice me. A confession that rounds out for the rounds out who I am. Then there are those who showcase themselves in extremis. Uh, Gia Tolentino in an essay called Ecstasy. She's talking about having taken the drug and she's now showing us who she is in those circumstances. I left the house and walked down in the valley and started to feel the drugs kick in when I was wandering in the scrub. The dry bushes became brilliant, greener, and a hummingbird torpedoed past me so quickly that I froze. I experienced for the first time Real's precise fantasy of disappearance. Each breath I took felt like it was echoing clangorously and impure reverberation. Reverberation, sorry. I wanted to see the landscape as it was when I wasn't there. So now we are meeting her when she isn't her conventional self. She's, she's sort of extended who she is and it's another version of herself, it's amplified. Carolyn Knapp, who died so tragically of lung cancer after she had finally quit drinking and become um, Gail Caldwell's best and most essential friend, wrote in Drinking a Love Story, I drank when I was happy and I drank when I was anxious and I drank when I was bored and I drank when I was depressed, which was often. And Roxanne Gay and Hunger also confessing herself in extremis. Writing this book is a confession. These are the ugliest, weakest, barest parts of me. This is my truth. This is a memoir of my body because more often than not, stories of bodies like mine are ignored or dismissed or divided. 
So a question cascade for you. And this is really important. Think about all that we've looked at, what you're comfortable with, what you're like, no way, I'm not touching that back. Thanks so much. You are the kind of writer who, what? Wants to be a vehicle for greater understanding? Seeks sympathy for the experience you have endured? Writes to come clean on the page? Or possesses a slight or more than slight exhibitionist predilection? What kind of writer are you? Your answer to that question, which could take weeks to resolve and could be different for every project that you work on and could be different for the day of the week you're living, is going to determine which of the exercises are going to appeal to you in the moment, which of the writing that I'm exerting from is like going to speak to you or not as a path forward for yourself. So you need to be able to articulate this to yourself at some point. This is Rembrandt Young, Self-Portrait in Order. We're just a few sections away from the end. I think that when we write self-portraiture, which is memoir, we also have to find the language for forgiving ourselves. Um, and I taught Megan Strisa, Stilstra's uh, Wake the Goddamn World in the series I'm doing now, which is called the Read Write series, where I take a single essay, sometimes two, just a few pages from it, and I deconstruct it to look at how did the writer achieve a certain means, whether we're looking, for example, at misunderstanding or regret. So I do love this essay. And um, this is Megan um, at the, towards the end of, of the piece where she has watched a violent argument go on in the street in Prague where she's living at the time and she didn't do anything. So she, by articulating her despair about her own action, she is also in a way forgiving herself. This is where in my memory, I apologize, digging through our shared patchwork language to find the right words. I'm so sorry, I should have done better. I will do better. I tell her how this time I will rush down the four flights of stairs and put my body between theirs. This time I will rush down the four flights of stairs, not in time to stop it, but still in time to help, to get her to a hospital or friends or a shelter. And this time I will scream, I'll wake the goddamn world. Another way of forgiving ourselves on the page and our self-portraiture is by admitting our own smallness. Kim Adonazio in Bukowski in a sundress puts it right out there. If you are at all successful, there are people who will be automatically, who will automatically envy, hate, and belittle you. Usually these people will be other writers who are less successful. The other day I saw an enormous poster on a bus stop advertising a best-selling author's novel. I happen to know that this novelist is a very nice person, but at that moment, the shriveled, jealous creature in me wanted her to die immediately in life. Ryan Doyle, I'm teaching him next time actually with, with Ross Gay, but we're gonna look at joy um, in the next read, right? But this is a mea culpa, <laughs> that's misspelled. Um, I laughed at gay people, I did. I snickered at their crew cuts and sachet and flagrancy. I snickered at the way they bristled about their rights, I did. I accused them of inventing disco. I laughed at their thing for feathers and glitter and fragrance and form-fitting uniforms. I grinned at the epic extravagance of gay pride parades. Then I stopped being such a nerd. So an exercise would be to return to a moment of regret and heal the wound by writing with retrospective compassion for the other and for yourself. Francesca Woodman, an extraordinary um, photographer who, who died of her own hand too soon. And then right up here towards the end, David Carr, The Night of the Gun. Uh, I don't know if you all know the story and I'll tell it very briefly, but he was a real idiot when he was younger. A uh, drug abuser, a mean guy, and, um, and, and 
father of twin girls. And he doesn't know who he was. He was so inebriated. He was so out of it most of the time. And now he wants to write a memoir, but he doesn't know. He doesn't know a lot. And one of the things that he doesn't know is how he ended up with this gun. Um, and he, he writes a book about fashioning himself by going to other people, doing the research, finding out who he is. He writes, even if I had amazing recall, and I don't, recollection is often just self-fashioning. Some of it is reflexive, designed to bury truths that cannot be swallowed. But other memories are just redemption myths writ small. Personal narrative is not simply opening up a vein and letting the blood flow toward anyone willing to stare. The historical self is created to keep dissonance at bay and render the subject palatable in the present. And so he can recreate himself and he does it with tremendous and lovable humility. And I will just tell you the story of David Stuart McLean and the answer to the riddle is me. He wakes up, the book begins, he's on a train platform in India. In India, he has nothing with him, no identifying information, and he doesn't have a clue who he is. He has, as it turns out, taken a medication for, um, you know, mosquito bites, um, whatever that, I'm forgetting the name of, but he has to be told everything about who he was. Who are his parents? Who's that girlfriend? What did he do? He has no idea it's gone. And the book is him going around asking people, who was I? And him finding out that he was a detestable person. He just didn't like who he found out he was. But you can fashion yourself out of incomplete memories if you're willing to do the research and to look hard and to listen. So none of us remember wholly we were doing Abigail Thomas on Sunday um, when we were, when we were um, looking at writing place in the Read Write, and she, I had a, shared a quote from her uh, snippet of an interview, and she said that she has a horrible memory except for the things that she remembers. And that's basically all of us, right? I mean, we don't remember 99% of the stuff that's happening to us, but we we have a sense of certain scenes. We have, we have something very intense and urgent and then a lot of white space. So a question cascade to help you fashion yourself or a scene that feels incomplete, ask you yourself, are you missing the proper nouns, the place, the names of others? Are you missing the time frame, the emotional or relational context, the words that were said, the beginning of the scene, the end and explanation. Write a passage that implicitly acknowledges and overcomes all that seems to be missing. All right, so don't be afraid of it. Approach it. Write about what isn't there. It could be some of the most profound writing in the book that you're, or the essay you might be working on, or the poem. And go. And the last slide is to say this, wife, daughter, self, you know, it's a book I really believe in. It's a book that uh, I wrote after so many years of not writing memoir and essay. And, um, and yet our books do not define us. Our books are not, you're going to get to know me as a person is not the same thing as having read my book. Um, and so in an act of wanting to be very clear with myself about that, I began to tear up copies of Wife, Daughter, Self, literally tearing the pages and making paper out of that book, mixing that paper with flowers, et cetera. So the, the paper you see there, you can see some of the words of Wife, Daughter, Self coming up through it. It's spider mums and paper pulp and, and Wife, Daughter, Self. And it is becoming, it has become, these books that I am making for other people. Um, I use it for end papers. I use it for, I, I frame it inside on, on cotty paper for some other types of books. Um, and it is my recognition that my, and I think it should be all of our recognition that the stories we write, we write them to open ourselves to the world, but to open readers to themselves. And if we fail to do that, and I have a catapult, you might want to look on my website, um, but my Beth Cuphart books website uh, for a piece I wrote about the universal in memoir came out I don't know, three or four months ago. Um, 
if we're, if we're not ultimately unlocking in the reader their own memories, their own scenes, we are at one level failing in our, in our desire to write memoir. And so I've torn up the pages of my book. I still have some copies though, because I really do love the book. And I putting them into these blank books and putting those blank books out into the world so that other people will begin to write their stories into that. And that is where I will um, stop my share and look and so open this up. And I will, if there are questions in the chat room, um, let me see where that chat room is. I'm gonna unmute myself. Oh, thank you everyone. Thank you, Beth, that was beautiful. Let's go right into the chat. Oh, and I have Gwen here librarian at Radnor Library saying they're gorgeous books and yes they are we've all gone to Etsy looking at bind by bind Sorry. I love that book thank you for writing it from Carmel um the handmade books are works of art I have bought two and plan to get more as gifts a beautiful background story about using your book pages inspirational Audrey thank you have you know, Audrey. I do want to thank you, Audrey, um, for you being so wonderfully kind about all of that. Right. Um, I uh, I appreciate that everything you've said and, and done. Okay. Um, is it do are any there questions? any questions about the making of memoir that anybody wants to put into the chat room or anything? It, it can be about what I said tonight, of course. Or I'm here to answer any question that any of you might have about the whole business of it all recognizing that it's 801 and you're either very hungry or about to do whatever. So yeah. just let me know if there are any questions. I don't know if there are any. Kathy, I wonder if you have any, um, oh wait, here's um, Anne, I love you. And of course, and Gwen, okay. And how do you decide what not to put in? Um, <laughs> There, there's, oh my gosh, 90% of it doesn't go in, when, And there are many answers to the question. One is, if you yourself are starting to feel the tedium of trying to connect one scene to another, um, if you are, um, I'm going to admit to prudence while we're talking, if you're, if you're feeling diligent and dutiful and just simply trying to tell the reader what happened, you're not writing memoir, you're not active, um, and the reader will feel that sluggishness. I think it's important, um, the other day I was asked about, um, uh, about you know, hurting other people, and um, I think it's really important I, I, to look at yourself in the round when you're writing, and make sure that you're looking at anybody else in the round too. No one is black and white. No one is cardboard thin. Um, everybody has a reason for doing what they're doing or being who they are. And mm -hmm. so I would not put in to, um, into a memoir anything that leaves either yourself or the other exposed to the possibility of being seen as thin as being as just a plot mover, as being seen as just the antagonist or just the protagonist. So I love books, memoirs that are sort of small in scenic scope, but are um, big in how those scenes are built and how they sit one beside another or how they echo later down the book. Two or three, what not to put in, but there are plenty of others. Um, Maya, hello. Um, what did you say? I think you said something about the three of writing memoir. Oh, I mm -hmm. don't know what that was. I don't know what that might have been. Yeah. Let me think that what that might have been. The three I, of writing memoir. I don't know. I don't either. But in in I will think about that if I, I will write to you if I can remember what it was, or I'll just go back and watch it. <laughs> um, uh, how do you, for those who may not have heard from you on this, how do you write memories of someone who has gone, Hillary, thank you. Um, I find that I'm doing that all the time, Hillary, now more and more with both of my parents gone, with my uncle, beloved uncle, of course, long gone, my grandmother and grandfather, all of these people, for some reason right now in my life, they are the ones that I'm keeping time with. They are the company I am keeping. And um, 
I am looking for any artifact, any shoelace that might have been on my father's shoe. I found a document not long ago in a box that showed me that my grandmother paid for her house at 6840 Geyer Avenue in Southwest Philadelphia. She was the one whose name was on the deed. Imagine that. And mm -hmm. so I just have that information about that time in her life. And I'm trying to build a sense for how did a woman come to have this purchase? Um, what was happening on that street then? You know, I'm building out from that document to, to the research of that time and that place. Um, I think that anything that we can find that is tangible, that they touched, that they wrote, any photograph, any story another has told, we collect them. And we don't write them all down. They're not all part of the story, but they are key to our understanding of them. And we write then what is most galvanizing about them, um, not just that we love them, but they have something to say to others about how we live how we take this thing called life on. Um, let me see, I'm looking, Roberta, thank you. I love you. I hope you're well. Um, so the three, look at Judy, she's our heroine. The three word reference classifying, looking at ourselves and saying, Judy, you're hired, you are hired. Not that you might've been looking for a job, but thank you. Karen, there you did it too, <laughs> there you all did. Lisa, so Muriel and Karen also get gold stars. How can we write with love a story about someone who has been cruel? Uh, Lisa, one of the most important questions, and I'm asked this often, um, and um, the answer to the question lies in the motivation. Why are you writing that story? Um, what is it you want to tell? What is it you have learned? Um, there are cruel people in this world. There are people who do hateful, things, things that cannot be set aside with some kind of sweeping love at the end. Um, sometimes and awfully those people do exist. You have to ask yourself when you're, and, and, and they leave tremendous scars behind and we must honor that that's real. You have to ask yourself, what is it that I want others to know about how we live with this kind of cruelty? or how we go on beyond this kind of cruelty. It's never about stopping with the cruelty. You have to know what goes past it, what goes around it. Think of it as a boulder and the river's running and what, what goes beyond it. And I think that might help. Um, Jessica, I'm so glad you were here and I'm so glad you were able to get the link. Um, I can't wait for you to hit those prompts either. Um, any, any other questions from anybody? Um, Kathy, I was thinking that you've watched so many of my presentations because you're such a good soul. <laughs> um, I love them. <laughs> I was, oh, and I, I see Carol has a, her hand up, so we'll go to her. Um, but you've heard so many writers talk about memoir in your store. You've read so many memoirs. Did anything that I say conflict with um, anything you've heard other memoirs say about the form? I, you know, not, not that I think of just off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely have heard authors focus on one thing over the others, like you cover a much broader approach to memoir. Mm -hmm. And I think that works. And, and it's interesting listening to authors speak because often they, you could predict sort of what they're going to come after reading the book, you sort of know what the most important thing to them is. Yes. Yeah. When they say, well, I guess that came through beautifully in the book and, you know, maybe other things weren't quite as important to them. So, I do think for better, for worse, I am not a best-selling memoirist. Everybody should know that. For better, for worse, I am always thinking about um, roundedness, universality, obsession vessel, lens, um, relational, um, how does one scene amplify or reconstruct another? Um, I'm so into the art and the craft of it. Um, and I think important truths come out of it, but never loud, banging, big story truths. They're quiet, profound things that I seek in the work that I read and in the work that I do. Carol, I see you have your hand up. 
sorry, it, it's it's not my name. My name is Tim Kirchner. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how Carol Myers got on the Zoom thing, but um, I saw I noticed that you are having this um, recorded, and I showed up half an hour late because I I, I went to the library thinking this was an in person meeting. <laughs> So anyways, I was just wondering um, how I can ma make up for the first half hour. Will we, you share Jane, we recorded it. Jane. So you will share the recording? Yes, yeah, once oh, the wonderful. recording is, yeah, we will, we'll have it from start to finish. But thank you for coming, Jane. Oh no, thank yeah. you so much. I'm sorry you missed the first half hour. Of that, I'm sorry, thank you. Too. I'm so sorry that that happened. <laughs> um, Jean, I do remember meeting you. I remember so well the conversation we had in 2018. And so thank you so much for being here tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if there's no other question, thank you, Kathy. You know, Beth, Beth I think about, and, and I didn't know you in, uh, you know, well, I think I've known you over 10 years now. So it's oh. over 30 books. <laughs> over 10 years but um I think early on like you said accolades and, and best-selling and all that but so very early on 1998 you wrote a book A Slant of Sun and it was a finalist for the National Book Award right. and I put that in memoir category sure and here it is years later over 30 books later and you're back to memoir Sure. Doing well, juncture yeah. workshops. So, uh, but I think early on that to be a National Book Award finalist for a memoir. So very early on in your writing career, um, I, I always think about that. And I think that's something that I'm proud of you for <laughs> that. And, and I remember when I first met you and we went back to the nonfiction and you said, I'm Beth Kempart. And there's my book. <laughs> oh, I bet I didn't say quite like I'm not quite like that. But I, I think perhaps just well, that, that was my experience meeting you <laughs> for the first time. And just, then and then you were able to write about yourself. You wrote Flow, which is my favorite book. And there you were writing as the Schuylkill River. Yes. In all her glory. You so think, you the think memoirist that? really recognized very early on yeah. and still today. Well, thank you. And thank you for having me here tonight. And Kathy, thanks for being there as always at Main Point. And they, at Main Point does sell these books um, and, uh, and I can come in and sign them. Um, and Lisa, thank you for being here. Muriel, thank you for being here. We appreciate how flexible all of you are. And I'm so sorry for those who went to the library tonight and we're looking mm, for me. Maybe I apologize. Maybe. So, okay, I will, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sign off and say- Thank you, thank you, Beth. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you okay. from okay. Radnor Library and Main Point Books, Kathy. And it's wonderful to see everyone here tonight. And I thank you all for joining us. Thank it's, you. It's, bye been, bye. it's been wonderful. Thank you, Beth. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.